I'm Scylla, and this is Lorenzo. We are doctors looking for a way to combine our passion for medicine with our love for exploration. We picked up our lives and sold all our stuff to start a new adventure. Subscribe to follow along. Hi, it's Dr. Abala, and I want to share three tips to get better at doing CPR. So I like to teach basic life support and advanced cardiac life support, especially when I'm working in capacity building in places with limited resources, because I think that you can have significant improvements in your chances of survival when you have a cardiac arrest with good high quality CPR, especially if you're thinking about technique. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that when you do compressions, It takes several seconds to build up the blood flow to get to a steady state that can provide the appropriate amount of oxygen and blood to your brain and to the rest of your body. However, as soon as you stop CPR, it plummets almost instantaneously. This is why you want to minimize the amount of interruptions when you do CPR. And the three tips that I'm going to provide are specifically aimed at reducing the duration and the frequency of these interruptions. Okay, so the one thing that I notice a lot of people learning basic life support and, and doing CPR in general is they have a hard time with pulse checks. So first, I want you to feel your own pulse just under the angle of your mandible, and you can try pressing with increasing and decreasing amounts of pressure to make sure that you feel it very nicely. Okay, maybe feel it on a friend. So I noticed that when somebody's doing CPR, and you're getting ready to do the pulse check. The pulse check in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And then the compressor stops and somebody scrambles to find the pulse. And in somebody that doesn't have a pulse, it's a little nerve wracking to try to find where that is. And maybe it's a stressful situation. Uh, maybe you're not so comfortable finding it. What I would recommend, number one tip, is put your finger on the pulse while the compressions are ongoing. This is because when the compressions are ongoing, if it's good high quality compressions, you're pushing the blood flow up to the brain through the carotid or through the femoral, whichever site that you're checking. And so you can definitely feel that pulse. When you have the hand on the pulse, you know that when the compressions stop, if you feel the pulse go away, then truly, it's pulseless, no pulse, and you can advise the team leader that this is the situation. And trust me, this improves your confidence in being able to tell if there's a pulse or not significantly. All right, so tip number two, when you do a pulse check, you're also doing a rhythm check. You're trying to make sure that, is this rhythm something that I need to provide defibrillation to? Is it like a VTAC or VFib without a pulse? When it is that situation and the rhythm is shockable, I notice that a lot of times the team leader says, shockable rhythm, prepare to defibrillate. And people immediately, as soon as they hear the word defibrillate, it's like touching a hot coal. Everybody puts their hands away and stops what they're doing, puts down everything. But realistically, you have several seconds for the person next to the defibrillator to press charge, to even set up the settings if they weren't set up right and provide the appropriate settings and charge for the electricity to be given. Those seconds are precious time that no blood flow is going. And so my recommendation is to continue doing CPR, at the very least CPR respirations too, until the person standing next to the defibrillator says all clear. That is their sim sign to say, okay, now everybody really stop touching the patient that we're going to give a lot of joules of electricity to try to defibrillate. Okay, so tip number three, this one is about keeping an efficient code. So every time we interrupt, as I said before, every time we interrupt chest compression, we immediately stop blood flow to the rest of the body. It drops off very quickly and it takes several seconds to get that flow going again. And so that is why we want to limit and be very algorithmic in the amount of interruptions. So every two minutes we do a pulse check and a rhythm check. Every, let's say four minutes, we give epinephrine. If you don't know what time the last step was done, 
it's hard to keep that regular routine. And I noticed that without keeping a stopwatch, people don't actually tend to wait long enough to do the amount of compressions and you end up doing more interruptions, more pulse checks at erratic times. The other benefit of setting a stopwatch, setting a timer, is that it allows the team leader to signpost what the next step is gonna be, and it allows for much more calm and quiet resuscitations because everybody knows in 30 seconds we're going to do a pulse check and a rhythm check. In one minute, we're going to give the next epinephrine dose. So whoever is doing those different roles can mentally prepare themselves, can start prepping the medication, what have you, and know what the next step is. So I hope that these three tips will come in handy as you either teach or learn how to do CPR and basic life support. I know that it is very helpful in reducing interruptions and improving the quality of your CPR from code to code. Code to code, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? Code to code. And it's so much 